A very good morning to everyone. May I please request all to rise for the national anthem. A very good morning to distinguished dignitaries, respected principals, esteemed resource persons, ladies and gentlemen. This is your chief program coordinator, Dr. Zalaika Homavasi from Wilson College. I welcome all to the second day of the seven days international online workshop on research methodology organized by Wilson College, KESS Shroff College and Vasantrao Dada Patil Institute of Management and Research in association with University of Mumbai. We are very fortunate to have amongst us our international resource person, Mr. Akira Nakajima from Tokyo, Japan. Mr. Akira Nakajima completed MBA in business development, having a great interest in product development and new applications development, started his career in the USA, started research activities jointly with senior scientist, Mr. Muroy and other group scientists. He invented a new type of thermos reflective coating in the USA. After returning to Japan in February 2016, he established a new company to start business in thermos reflective coating and started production in Japan by February 2017 in just a matter of a year. In continuous search to have unique technology to make world's best product, continuous research and development was undertaken since 2017 to introduce nanotechnology and bring several benefits and features in one single product. Now, thermoreflective coating, Sunbless, is addressing every problem in construction and infrastructure industry, reducing heat, temper reduction by about 30 to 40 percent, protection from water leakage and seepage, relief from wall and ceiling molds, protection from salt and water corrosion near coastal areas, protection from chemical environment, and protection from global warming. Mr. Nakajima has a vision and goal to develop fire prevention coatings and better thermal insulation coatings so that current energy losses will be reduced in every house and building infrastructure. Soon, Mr. Nakajima will be launching thermos reflective coatings for automobiles that could bring revolution in hot cities in India, resulting in a cool, comfortable drive by reducing fuel energy consumption. 
We are indeed honored for Mr. Akira Nakajima from Tokyo, Japan address us. I request the relay of sir's message. Good morning. My name is Akira Nakajima, a scientist and businessman from Tokyo, Japan. This is wonderful morning in India to start online workshop on research methodology. My greetings to Dr. Suhas Penedekar, Vice Chancellor, Mumbai University, Dr. Sibare, Dr. Ali, and Chartered Accountant, Mr. Shinde, trustee members, Cyber, and all participants. Now, the world is going through this century's biggest pandemic caused by COVID-19, which is going to force the world to rethink its existing way of functioning and bring about a paradigm shift in areas of research, business, education, manufacturing, healthcare. I look at this as a great opportunity and the right time for all my Indian friends to create a new and futuristic vision about research and development and associated thought process that exists today in India. Year 2020 will open out new areas of scientific pursuits and working methodologies for scientists to explore new areas and start working on latest state-of-the-art and more relevant research fields to meet new challenges. Some of the new challenges will come in the field of healthcare, nanotechnology applications in healthcare, medicines, and global warming solutions. We scientists in Japan have always seen global warming as a bigger challenge than COVID-19. While we for sure would come out soon with an effective vaccine or a medical cure for COVID-19, the challenges of controlling the rising environmental pollution due to human beings' development aspiration will always remain the biggest threat and the larger challenge for us to overcome. You would have noticed the huge difference in the pollution levels worldwide and especially in India between January 2020 and April 2020. When the world stopped working, air quality improved but stopping work for obvious reasons cannot be a solution. Uh, we need to control the environment even when we are working at full strength. And there lies the challenges for the scientists. Scientists normally go for innovations by studying the existing issues and needs of the society and visualizing the futuristic programs. I had my initial research career in the United States of America and made many Indian friends there. They are highly educated, smart, and enthusiastic. I always see and feel that Indian people are better in the education system, but I learn from friends that India has minimum research activities in product development, 
and the product application development. Hence, I appear to all of you to bring about a change in this, to make India more developed in research and then together we scientists from Japan can closely work together with young Indian scientists in order to develop the world. I would like to share my research experience in product development. We identified a global warming issue and embedded a unique solution which will help to reduce carbon footprint by reducing air conditioner usage, fossil fuel, and at the same time give multiple benefits to the society. My Japanese team has been working on solutions for energy savings, protecting the world from global warming. We took three years to develop the thermal reflective coating with nanotechnology. Then, in the last three years, we are working to improve the product to make world's best solution. My Indian colleague and friend Sudesh Rokade is a great asset for us. He has given us a vision to look beyond the Japanese, US and European market, which we Japanese normally have till now considered as main business places and now develop products and technology to work specifically in the countries, in the Asian, African regions, and those markets. We focus on the issues being faced in India and other tropical countries and challenges being faced there related to buildings, infrastructures, and other practical problems in the real field, which led us to develop uh, the world's first unique uh, thermal reflective coating, which simultaneously address heat of building, reduces building temperatures by 30 to 40 percent, and increases its life, protects buildings from water leakage, seepage, relief from wall, ceiling mold, protects buildings from seawater corrosion near coastal belt, relief from rooftop noise during heavy rainfall, promote energy savings by reducing air conditioner usage. This, this thermal reflective coating can be very effectively used on vehicles to reduce heat uh, air conditioner usage and hence uh, reduces global warming. Combining and bringing in all multiple uh, properties in one solution was a great challenge for us, but we could achieve it. Now, in India, we are working for its new application to use as insulation material to minimize uh, energy losses. COVID-19 also focused us to develop a new coating that could kill virus within a few minutes to reduce risk of outbreak. Normally, the virus is active on different surfaces from 3 to 12 hours. If we can kill them within 20 to 30 minutes with new surface coating treatment, then naturally 
the spread would reduce. This is how products are developed. We, the Japanese scientists and businessmen, will need support of young Indian talent to assist us in developing new application engineering in India. I also request Indian colleagues and universities, oh, colleges and universities to closely work with Japanese people to develop new solutions for India and new educational curriculum and programs for the students in colleges and universities. Your support in conducting local application tests and then uh, developing manufacturing methodology at economical costs will help the society in a big way. I am thankful to my friend Sudeshi Rokade, President Arahan Group and Dr. Darby, Director of Cyber, for giving this opportunity, for expressing my thoughts uh, through this inaugural speech, and I wish you all a great success in this workshop and your research activities. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind message of how research can play a pivotal role in new product development. I now request Dr. Vinita Isaimani to introduce the first SDK. Thank you. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning to one and all present for this seven day international online workshop on research methodology. We welcome Dr. Anil Kumar G. Garg, former director of business school, Ubli, Bapuji B School, Devnagri, Belgaum Institute of Management Studies, Belgaum. He is an engineer, MBA, company secretary executive with a PhD in finance with rich experience in stock markets, investment banking, and 19 years of experience in management education. His doctoral thesis was titled Valuation of Futures in Indian Stock Markets. He was a member of the Board of Studies and Examinations at various universities and autonomous colleges. His publications include three books, newspaper articles in English, Kannada and Marathi, several research papers in referred national and international journals. He has presented papers at various national and international conferences. He is a recognized guide for PhD at Vishweshwaraya Technical Technological Institute, University, All India Management Association and Jain University. I'm sure all the participants today will go out with an enlightened knowledge on various research aspects. We welcome you, sir. We thank you for gracing the workshop with your presence. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, you are audible, sir. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm just sharing my screen. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, one of the uh, biggest challenges of uh, talking on to an online audience is that when you say good morning, everybody, nobody replies back because most yes. of them are on mute. <laughs> good morning, sir. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> okay. Um, I uh, before we start off this uh, day's session. I would like to mention that uh, you know this was um, something like a bolt from the blue for me when uh, Dr. Ramesh uh, from Goa University, who happens to be my PhD guide also, um, he called up and said, "I want you to take up this um, these two sessions for the research methodology workshop." Uh, I'd like to thank him for giving me this opportunity, and I'd like to also thank uh, the uh, Wilson College. Uh, University of Mumbai, the uh, 
कॉलेज ऑफ आर्ट्स एंड कॉमर्स के ई शॉप का कॉलेज ऑफ आर्ट्स एंड कॉमर्स एंड वसंत राव दादा इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मैनेजमेंट स्टडीज संगली फॉर दिस नाइस एंडेवर दैट यू हैव टेकन अप माई एक्सपेक्टेशन वॉज अराउंड हंड्रेड पार्टिसिपेंट्स और मे बी हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी पार्टिसिपेंट्स और समथिंग लाइक दैट बट दिस इज फेनोमिन close to 1000 participants for a research methodology workshop and uh, you know this kind of academic uh, interest and enthusiasm is uh, really commendable for all the uh, people in academics so i would like to congratulate all of you for uh, taking this time out and uh, uh, giving so much time to learning research so let's begin with uh, today's uh, proceedings uh, today i am uh, supposed to take this session uh, on types of variables scales of measurement data editing and data group uh, if i am not uh, wrong uh, i should be finishing this uh, session by 130 is that right or uh, earlier um Sir, uh, ideally it is one uh, o'clock, but we can extend till one thirty, including the question answer round. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Let's begin. Um, you know, when we talk of variables, uh, the uh, the funny part of uh, defining anything like a variable is uh, people want to define it in various ways. So. Uh, i pulled out a uh, pulled out a small diagram from somewhere uh, which says that variables can be either classified as qualitative or quantitative quantitative or they can also be classified as categorical and discrete or continuous <clears throat> so when you have variables uh, which are qualitative uh, they are of two two types of scales one is uh, a nominal scale or an ordinal scale <clears throat> and quantitative variables are usually of interval scale and ratio scale now let's see what this means um, we have a full list of uh, description of these variables in the next slides so uh, it suffices to say that there are four kinds of variables um, in this slide uh, nominal ordinal interval and ratio we will take one by one and try to find out um, what these scales mean uh, what uh, how do we use them and how do we uh, use the data that we can we collect from these uh, using these uh, variables so first let's start with the nominal scale <coughs> nominal scale is nothing but a name you know nom nomination or uh, nominee or uh, nominal it's all about name so if you ask people what is your name you are using a nomination nominal scale if you are asking whether you are a male or female you are using a nominal scale whether you are a purchaser or a non purchaser you are using a nominal scale <clears throat> whether you belong to a particular uh, class a particular caste a particular religion a particular uh, place a particular um, locality whatever you ask for is all nominal because it has a name towards it <clears throat> um what do we do with it we determine whether they are equal in the sense okay are you from mumbai yes then that means the nominal scale says okay mumbai people are all these people so you know that is that is what determination of equality is <clears throat> so Mm, determination of equality is the basic empirical operation of a nominal scale, and uh, typical statistics that we use is percentage. <clears throat> uh, if you look at uh, any of uh, any project report or any uh, any report from research, you will find that uh, so many percentage of people um, belong to this category, that category, and things like. That. In fact. Um, if you look at the covid 19 statistics these days which is very uh, interesting you will find that uh, people say that we have 33% recovery Now, recovery is an obvious 
So how many people recovered? How many people did not recover? No, people who are active, people who are who have recovered, people who have contracted the disease, and people who have expired out of this disease. So these are the four different phases of uh, this pandemic. Each one of them can measure. It's a nominal risk. <clears throat> um, but the number, when you talk about the number, it becomes a ratio scale. But when you just classify people and say that this fellow is uh, uh, positive, this fellow has recovered, this fellow has, uh, you know, um, is still active, that means that, that is, those, those states are nominal scales. And how, what, how do you infer, how do you, what uh, tools do you use to infer uh, out of a nominal scale? The classic chi-square test <coughs> or the binomial test. You know, the, these are, this is what comes to the nominal scale. Now let's go to the next scale. The ordinal scale. Ordinal scale is something which is taught to our students, to our uh, children from a very, very, I think, uh, from their childhood onwards. Uh, which rank did you get? First rank, second rank, third rank, fourth rank, this, all these rankings, all these percentiles, uh, all the examinations and the gradings uh, that happen after the, after the marks are given, you know, once you start saying that, uh, you get a NEET rank, you get a MHCET rank, or you get a CET rank, uh, you get a IIT JWE rank. All these are, this is all ordinal scale. <clears throat> the typical usage is the rankings and preference data. Which one do you prefer? Do you prefer uh, first preference, second preference, third preference? This, that is what is preference data. Then market position. We also uh, use it to uh, describe the market position. Market position, when I say, uh, basically, you know, who's the market leader? Who's the, uh, uh, the market leader, second uh, in rank, third in rank, etc. So that is also, uh, you know, that, that's also one of the uses of the ordinary scale. Then we also measure attitude measures. Uh, does somebody have a completely highly positive attitude towards something, or a fairly positive and uh, positive attitude, or a neutral attitude, or a disagreeable kind of an attitude? So you know these are basically ordinal scale gives us the order of preference. And then other, many other psychological measures are also, uh, you know, we use ordinary scale. <clears throat> uh, the way we uh, analyze it is by descriptive analysis. And when we say descriptive analysis, it is basically the median. And uh, how do we, uh, what statistical techniques do we use? We use Man Whitney U test, Friedman Turia Nova, rank order correlation, and all these things. <clears throat> I will not be going into the details of the statistical measures. I would only be uh, mentioning them. The reason being, uh, there, is, there is a lot to go in this method, in this research methodology workshop, and. Um, Lot of more people are there who are going to handle this. <clears throat> Lot of other people are going to handle this. Anyway, so uh, that's what an ordinal scale is. Next comes the interval scale. An interval scale <coughs> basically measures whether a particular variable, a particular data set that you are, we are using falls in between two different uh, points. So, you know, uh, what it basically does is it determines whether uh, the data set falls in a 
particular interval. <coughs> so if you take, let's say, you take a class of, um, if you take a college, uh, then if there are out of 3,000 students in a college, uh, how many people are of the age of 18 to 19? And how many people are there in the age of 19 to 20? How many from the age of 20 to 21? That's the interval. The, the, the age between 18 and 19, 19 to 20, 20 to 21, that is the interval. <coughs> that is the basic operation of an interval scale. And where do we use it? We use it in index numbers. These days, uh, index numbers are uh, have become very um, very popular, um, and then we also use it for attitude measures, the level of knowledge about brands. Um, basically, we we try to find out uh, how many people know something, you know, how many people know uh, between zero to ten percent. 10 to 20 percent, 20 to 30 percent, etc. So what we are basically doing is we are classifying people in intervals. We are classifying data sets in intervals. Uh, descriptive statistics, basically, you know, uh, statistics that we use to describe this is again mean, then range, and then standard deviation. And uh, what is the kind of inferential uh, tests that we use? Uh, it is uh, product moment correlation, t-test, and factor analysis, or ANOVA. These are uh, the typical statistical tools that are used for interval scale. Let's go to the next one, the ratio scale. Ratio scale basically is about numbers, hard numbers. And uh, when you say, when you ask somebody, how many students are there in your college, and he says 3,500, 3, so that's a ratio scale. When you count numbers, it becomes a ratio scale. A ratio scale can also be uh, continuous. It may not, it need not be discrete. Uh, it can be uh, something like uh, with a decimal point. Like if you ask the um, Somebody, how much, uh, how much wheat did you buy? And if he says 1.26 kgs, that's a ratio scale. <clears throat> and where do we use it? We use it in sales when we when we count sales. When we try to report sales, count sales. That's when we use. It. Uh, we use it for units produced. We use it for number of customers. We use it for costs. Because these are all hard numbers from which we are able to count. Uh, typical statistic, you know, statistical usage is coefficient of variation to understand uh, ratio uh, scales. <coughs> okay, so these are the types of variables: the nominal, ordinal, interval, and uh, ratio. We collect this these data sets. And uh, when we collect these data sets, then we um, administer these, you, we uh, put them through something called as a statistical test to find out whether they are uh, right or whether what we have collected is okay or not okay. <coughs> Many times uh, it so happens that uh, we talk of the reliability of the data that is collected. Take COVID-19, for example. Uh, we have just crossed one lakh cases. But there are a lot of people in the country who think that we have not crossed one lakh, we must have crossed nearly five lakh cases. Because they don't believe, they don't rely on the numbers that are put out. They think that the reliability of this counting, of this uh, data collection is wrong. Uh, RBI comes up with uh, the numbers for inflation every two months. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever inflation numbers are uh, flashed, uh, people talk and say that these numbers do not really uh, reflect what is the reality in the country. Uh, 
what they are basically saying is they don't rely on those numbers nor or they are um, doubting the reliability of the So how do you test reliability? Test, retest. You try to apply the same measure to the same objects at the second time. Uh, have, if you have ever had a blood test, a uh, fasting uh, sugar uh, blood test, for uh, measuring fasting sugar, uh, you will find that the doctor, uh, whenever you take a blood test, and if, it fi if he finds that uh, the, uh, the number is a little bit on the higher side, the doctor would say, you take a test another 10 days later. Why? Because he, wa he also thinks that you should retest to find it reliable. If you happen to have hypertension, okay, same case. You are supposed to test your hypertension or your BP on the same, day, same time on the same every day for a couple of days to really get the, get a reliable measure. That's again, test, retest, reliability. Applying the same measure to the same objects, second time, third time, fourth time, etc. <clears throat> Alternative forms of reliability, measuring the same objects by two instruments that are designed to be as nearly alike as possible. Uh, COVID-19, <clears throat> test kits. People are uh, talking of uh, two or three types of testing that is done on COVID-19 patients. They want to measure the same COVID-19 positivity or negativity by using two or three different instruments. Why? Because they want to ascertain the reliability of uh, the result, whether it is positive or negative or whatever. <clears throat> So that's another, uh, that's another, that's alternative forms of reliability. People, a lot of times, people do not look at um, alternative forms, they look at internal comparison. Comparing the responses among various items on a multiple item index designed to measure a homogeneous concept. <clears throat> People already have an index. They already have a bar, a benchmark. And they, based on that benchmark, uh, testing is done. Testing is done to see whether that benchmark, whether you uh, whether you comply with the benchmark or not. That's the internal comparison. <clears throat> then the last one is scorer reliability. Uh, again, coming back to uh, the testing, uh, coming back to let's say you, you go to a doctor and he measures your blood pressure. When the compounder measures your blood pressure, you may get a different reading. When an intern uh, measures the blood pressure, you may get a different reading. When the doctor measures your blood pressure, you may get a different uh, reading. So, which reading do you, uh, you find, do you think is reliable? Reliability happens when all three have the same reading. Yeah, somebody is raising the hand. Um, sir, the questions will be taken at the end. You please continue. No problem. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, those who score, those who test, those who collect data, they need to be, uh, you know, uh, th that reliability is also a very vital reliability. Let's say um, in, the, in, the, in the PhD research, you are collecting some uh, material. You are, you are collecting some uh, data from by conducting a survey. If you are collect, collecting yourself, that's one thing. But if you have given it to some more people, if you have, if you have uh, given uh, data collection to three or four people to collect data on your behalf, uh, it is not necessary that all the three or four people do the same kind of, uh, same standard of work that uh, you expect out of them. Then 
uh, the reliability of the scorer comes into the picture. <coughs> then you try to find out um, which one is more, you know, you, you try to find, you do test reset, three test there, you try to give the same questions to, uh, you try to, try to give the same uh, respondents to somebody, somebody else to try to find out the scorer reliability. So reliability comes in all forms, in four forms, basically uh, test retest, alternative forms, internal comparison, and score. <clears throat> Once data is collected, the next thing that comes to mind is validity. Whether the data that is collected is valid or not. <clears throat> And content, first thing about validity is content validation. Content validation assesses this representativeness or the sampling adequacy of the items contained in the measuring instrument. Uh, if, if the data that is collected is valid, is good enough, then sampling error will not be there. <clears throat> then we would have collected the right uh, sample. <clears throat> the second one is criteria related validation. Involves inferring an individual score or stand standing on some measurement for criteria from the measurement <clears throat> uh, I had a, I usually have a very uh, you know, uh, interesting anecdote to uh, talk about when we talk of criteria related values. Uh, a group of uh, Eureka Forbes salesmen, usually, you know, Eureka Forbes salesmen uh, have a very unique way of uh, selling their products. They do something called as, they, they do something called as survey come sales. They go to the, they go to individual houses, ask them whether they have uh, a water purifier, whether they have a, a you know a vacuum cleaner, and uh, based on that, if they don't have them, they say okay, they will try to pitch for it. <coughs> um, but they are given a very um, very detailed brief on where to approach and whom to. Approach. Uh, usually, the brief is uh, to identify identify a middle class locality and uh, meet people in the uh, in the middle middle class and the upper middle class uh, homes <coughs> and try to sell them this uh, water purifier and lucky drink. Usually the uh, way the uh, the way uh, the frame sampling frame is uh, defined is that it should be a house with at least a two-wheeler at home and uh, you know that, that that is a social status kind of a thing at least a two-wheeler should be there at home or two two-wheelers at home it used to be a place where um, there were only independent houses and uh, the brief was uh, there should be at least a two two-wheelers at home and uh, you can go and contact such houses one salesman usually used to come out with, used to add one more um, one more qualifier to it. He used to look at two two-wheelers and no dog because he was afraid of dogs. So whatever data you know that kind of a person brings in may not be the correct valid data because criteria related validation fails in this case. <coughs> In criteria related validation, you will also find that concurrent validation is there. Concurrent validation involves assessing the extent to which the obtained score may be used to estimate an individual's present standing with respect to some other value. And or predictive validation. If a person meets the criteria today, it is concurrent validation. If a person meets the criteria, maybe may meet the criteria tomorrow, it becomes predictive validation. 
The, la the last one is construct validation, understanding the meaning of the obtained instrument. Uh, it is important for the researcher to understand uh, the meaning of the obtained measurement. Just collecting data, uh, whether it is valid or not, has no meaning. <coughs> the person collecting the uh, data or uh, the, the collect data, the collected data should have, you know, should have some meaning to it. You go to a supermarket these days, they, uh, they measure your temperature. They are also collecting data. And what is the construct? The construct is that if your temperature is higher than a particular benchmark, then you are not allowed inside the shopping mall. That's the construct. <clears throat> this valid, but people should, but, but you know, whether you are a valid customer or invalid customer depends on the, on the temperature that you are running on that day. This validity also has to be understood. You know, this is a very, uh, it's a very simple ratio scale. You know, you have to, you have to collect, you have to uh, measure the temperature of the person and uh, the person is latent. <clears throat> but if this, if this, whether this uh, thing is valid or not is a question. After a, long, after a long study, people have, dis have uh, discovered that uh, you should have, if, if you have temperature, then you may have, uh, you may be infected. But when, but when this criteria first came in, or uh, when somebody is asymptomatic, as they say, then this construction or construct validation fails because uh, the construct is that one should have temperature to be uh, infected, but you can be asymptomatic. Then there is no validation, validity for this uh, criteria. So, you know, construct validation involves, that's what, that's where it says construction, construct validation involves understanding the meaning of the obtained measurement. Just, just obtaining the measurement is not enough. One should understand the meaning. It's not just fever. Maybe the fever has dry cough, no fever. So measurement has to be, you know, um, has to have two or three more variables. <clears throat> anyway, so that uh, that apart, the idea was to uh, convey the um, meaning of construct uh, validation. Uh, sir. Yeah. Now, sorry to interrupt you. A lot of participants are messaging that they are unable to hear you clearly. Is it? Uh, sir, is if there are two devices placed nearby, there could be interference. I mean, the laptop and the phone or something, if it is nearby, there could be interference. Okay. Uh, one minute. I'll just, I'll just, one minute. I'll just make some. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, sir. That's better. Thank you. I think I need to put this somewhere very near my uh, mouth and that way it will be possible. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Sorry for the interruption. No, no. Uh, one more question. The, uh, they were not able to hear because, uh, because sound is low or uh, is there some uh, disturbance also? Uh, sir, uh, there is some background noise and some disturbance. The sound was proper, but uh, they had to concentrate on what you were saying. Okay. There, there happens to be no background noise because it may be some electronic interference there. Correct, correct. Now it's better, yeah. sir. Yeah. Better. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> we looked at uh, types of variables. We looked at uh, reliability, validity of data. Now we will look at uh, how to develop this measurement. The first step in developing a measurement is uh, specify, specifying the domain of concept. Uh, being, a, being from the management background, uh, uh, being from, uh, you know, having taught uh, marketing uh, research, uh, many of my examples uh, may be marketing related. <clears throat> 
but nevertheless uh, since marketing is uh, all encompassing uh, people would i think people would relate to it uh, the first step is to specify domain of concept like uh, what is the brand image uh, let's take a simple example uh, what is the brand image of uh, a title watch so that that's that becomes the domain of concept second question that comes up is generate sample of items uh, sample of items like uh, what should be the question uh, what kind of phrases title watch means what whether whether it means um, aspirational whether it means um, a wealthy man whether it means somebody who is um, with the times or uh, whether it means um, you know statements phrases etc whether it means uh, somebody who is stylish or uh, whether it means somebody who is conservative or whether it means uh, somebody who can uh, afford the uh, watch um, or somebody who looks for value for money so many sample of items is, you know you can generate so many such questions <coughs> and once you have a list of all these questions then you start purifying purifying there means that whether the question that i have asked whether it is affordable okay title watches of 2000 3000 rupees may not be affordable so maybe this is not what i'm looking for title watches look very good so maybe this is what i'm looking for stylish is right or um, value for money maybe some uh, at the lower rent they may be right but stylish may be right upper class may be right um, things like that you, know, you try to purify it <clears throat> once you start purifying the what you are doing is eliminating all the unwanted items and then you collect data for reliability and validity assessment how do you do that you ask you do a test uh, you do a test uh, you can test your question and try to find out from people what do they think about uh, the same brand you put you you throw out questions maybe throw out 50 questions and ask them what uh, they think about the brand out of this out of those questions maybe 25 may be relevant 30 may be relevant <clears throat> once once your uh, your test uh, you know population says that okay this is these questions are right these questions can be uh, asked then you test the reliability and test the validity whether the same thing is uh, thought of by others also then you administer the question then that is when you measure administer the uh, question <clears throat> that's how the whole measurement development happens a um, lot of times we find that uh, people come to us and say that uh, i have uh, i want to do some research i want to do some phd uh, i want to do research and obtain a phd and half my thesis is ready then uh, the question that has to be asked is uh, Do you have? You know, usually they ask when we say, "What? Okay, what? What? What is the objective of your study? And um, what are your assumptions, etc." Then people real people realize, no, 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 this is just the wrong way of doing it. <clears throat> we, we go back to measurement development. So specifying the domain concept, domain of concept is very, very important. People um, spend. more time on this on measurement of uh, on measurement development on research design <clears throat> the more time you spend on research design the less uh, time you need to spend on analysis because you already know what you will do next but uh, if you don't spend time on uh, research design on developing the correct measurement then you will end up spending a lot of time on on purifying the data trying to uh, edit the data remove the unwanted things 
because you collected a lot. From it. <clears throat> so that's where you know uh, when uh, when I was asked to write uh, when I was asked to talk about um, data editing after types of variables, I decided I said no, I should talk about measurement development because once your measurement instrument is correct, then the data that you collect will be all right. But if your if your measurement instrument is not right, if you have not done uh, all these steps, then probably you will not be able to correct the, collect the correct kind of data. And if you don't collect the correct kind of data, you end up uh, doing uh, a lot of circus at the end, during the analysis time. Next, we come to the second uh, part of this, uh, that is data editing, data coding, data consolidation, tabulation, and of course, exploratory data analysis. <clears throat> data editing. When data is being collected in the uh, on the field there is a lot of chance to edit the data then and there um, many times <clears throat> it so happens that um, the questionnaire that we develop to collect data especially in in the marketing setting we develop a questionnaire and go to uh, go to the prospective customers, prospective respondents, and ask them these questions. Um, one of the major uh, issues that I have uh, always encountered uh, about this is that uh, when the day, when the questionnaire is designed, it is designed by. MBA students or uh, students of social sciences or postgraduate degrees and uh, they use their own um, vocabulary in uh, developing these questionnaires and you administer them the same words don't mean the same thing to the uh, data collector and the data uh, respondent the respondent does not understand those words so he thinks there's something else and thinks something else. Um, many times it also happens, you know, uh, when you're doing ranking or rank order, you just say, uh, please give marks to this. Uh, from one to 10, you give them some marks to some attributes. Some people think giving one mark is supposed to be very good and giving 10 marks is supposed to be very bad. And some people think even 10 on 10 is good and 1 is very bad. Uh, people from the academic side usually give 10 on 10, say think that 10 on 10 is the right thing to do. But uh, other people, some people think that giving first rank is good and you know, they, they don't look at 10 on 10 or 1 on 10 or things like that. They think in terms of ranks. A lot of uh, miscommunication. And because of this, you tend to get wrong data. <clears throat> so uh, when you get such kind of data, uh, when, you, when you are there while taking this data down, or when, when somebody is filling up your questionnaire, field editing is very important. You can edit it then and then. Once that is done, once, once the responses are collected, then we come to in-house editing. Uh, first thing that happens is wrong, correcting wrong entries. A lot of wrong entries happen and if you know what is the correct answer, then you correct the wrong entries. Uh, sometimes uh, there's a confusion, then you go back to the respondents for answers, responses. Uh, you find that um, somebody has written that I have four children, and uh, but the details of only two children are written. You go back to the respondents for answers, responses. Somebody says that uh, you know, he is married, but says the size of the family is only one single. You go back again, try to find out what happened. So, a lot of things happen like this. Size of family, uh, 
marital status um, salary uh, figures lot of unsatisfactory respondent uh, responses come up uh, in one uh, sometimes you know there is an awareness question you ask people at your work yes but uh, the next question where uh, where you think to when you go a little deep uh, is goes unanswered some people say i am not aware of anything and then answer uh, deep questions so back tracking sometimes uh, is required then allocating missing values uh, sometimes um, values are missed so sometimes when you do uh, we are locate those missing values by uh, not conjuring up our own values but uh, using our common sense to see that what what can be the missing value then plugging the value uh, sometimes people leave uh, there are there is a non response error people leave in between in, in in a form some some numbers are left so what you do is you plug in a average value or a neutral value so that you are uh, in the analysis it, it doesn't make a big uh, change <coughs> uh, otherwise you know uh, so suddenly you will find a, either a big dip or a big high in the graph so plugging with a neutral value is uh, very important and discarding unsatisfactory responses um, for every response for for all the responses that are collected there are bound to be there is, there is bound to be something like a non response error where people don't respond uh, there are also bound to be a lot of unsatisfactory responses and uh, unsatisfactory responses in the sense uh, people uh, usually go in for um, taking uh, all everything kind of thing um, so you know especially with paper surveys this happens uh, to ask them to uh, tick which is the most preferred one they tick everything <coughs> because there's no uh, you can't stop them in online surveys you can it's a radio button if you tick if you click on one the other thing you cannot click the on the other thing but um, in uh, paper surveys that uh, that cannot be um, you know stop so discarding such unresponsive unsatisfactory responses is also part of the data editing process <clears throat> next we come to with, uh, once we collect the data then we come to data coding <clears throat> data coding has to be done based on what analysis we are going to to at the end of the uh, end, end of this data code for example uh, we have a example here where um, the first question says uh, would you like to buy ready to eat food products the answer is yes or no and if somebody says yes we give we write one there in the excel sheet uh, with the symbol x1 and um, if he says no then we write zero at the end of the and uh, let's say we collect some 300 responses at the end of the uh, at, at the end of doing all the coding we will be able to know how many people have said yes how many people have said no or usage for that matter same thing used to uh, do you would you like to use ready to eat food products again yes or no if you if we are able to get yes or no and then you know we can easily get percentages <coughs> we can get percentages we can do uh, binomial uh, hypothesis test a peer test of proportion so a yes or no just you know in the coding sheet you, instead of writing a y or n it's easier to write one or zero if you are able to write one or zero then it's easy to add up all the ones you just add the entire excel uh, that uh, column you get no only yes sir otherwise you need to if you have written y and n then you need to count the number of y and count the number of no so coding sheet is basically to uh, make your life a little easy then comes another question another example of a question an interval question uh, age 
less than 20 years, 21 to 26, 27 to 35, 36 to 45, above 45. There again. <coughs> uh, one suggestion is uh, less than 20 years, you, uh, you code it as 1. Uh, 21 to 26, you code it as 2. 27 to 35, you code it as 3. 36 to 45, you code it as 4. More than 45, you code it as 5. But what happens in this kind of case? Now, especially I put this up uh, just to uh, exhibit something important. What happens if you uh, code it this way? You cannot add these numbers. And uh, because if you add them, you get something which is irrelevant. The best way would have been, you know, <coughs> You write uh, less than 20 years, um, 21 to 26, 27 to 35, all this, you know. Uh, there are two, three ways in which you can code them. One is you put, uh, take the midpoint of the interval and put that as the number so that you can take an average uh, age at the end. Second is you, you write A, B, C, D, E as codes so that uh, you, can, you can count the number of A's, number of B's, number of C's, number of D's, number of E's and then say if you have five, if you have 50 number of A's then you can say there are 50 respondents who are below the age of 20 years. Interval scale, uh, you know, you could use it uh, very uh, effectively uh, if you could use midpoints of those intervals. But in this case, uh, since it is more than, yeah, since it is more than 45 years, uh, midpoint doesn't make any uh, sense there. Next example is the ranking of the attributes. Ranking of the attributes is ordered. Uh, it's, it's an order. So people give ranks, uh, first rank, second rank, third rank, fourth rank, fifth rank. Um, you can you simply write those ranks in the in the coding sheet so that um, you know you can get an average rank at the end you can use the number of uh, number of people who have given different ranks so a lot of uh, uses of uh, those ranks can be done the fourth example is our ratio scale, where you're, they are just numbers. So ratio scale is basically a number. That, that there's no, uh, you can have uh, basic arithmetic number. So number of children, they can't be uh, between one and two or something like that. Uh, neither can it be ordinal. So number of children is a, a hard number. It's a rational number. So you use it as the number is given. So uh, nominal, uh, basically, when you're coding nominal uh, scale, you assign a number to it. When you're coding an interval scale, you either assign a number or assign an uh, alphabet or take the midpoints and assign those midpoints as uh, the codes. So there are three ways of doing it. When you rank the attributes, when you're doing ordinal scales, you the, use the ranks that are given. When you're, doing, uh, when you're using the ratio scale, use the ratio number that, that is given. So that's how uh, data coding happens. Yeah. Classification and tabulation. How, how do we classify the data? Classification can happen on the basis of attributes, on the basis of score, on the basis of marital status, all these attributes that we are trying to collect. <coughs> then classification can happen based on class intervals. Class intervals uh, basically a frequency, a frequency distribution table. And uh, sometimes ratio data can also be classified into class intervals. If you are uh, if you are collecting a lot of uh, data, like census data is collected, and uh, you know, income ranges are then decided based on uh, using the class interval. So you can collect discrete data and then use it to you know tabulate that, classify it as. Um, 
numerical uh, as a class interval. <coughs> Tabulation also involves, uh, you know, classification uh, and tabulation is basically orderly arrangement of data. You try to put it in an array, try to put it in a, ta in a table. <coughs> uh, people like uh, like it when uh, they see uh, data in arranged in an array. Uh, somehow that is uh, that that is like if you just throw data, at people may not, may not like. That's why you know. Uh, if you look at uh, your uh, daily COVID updates, it says world data and then it's in a tabulation form. It says uh, so many infected, again, so many uh, active cases, so many recovered and so many expired. So that's a tabulation basically. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, we are right on time to for all the questions, all the uh, hands that were raised. Uh, we can get on with the uh, questions. There are. Sure, sir. Thank you so yeah. much for the question. Yeah. I will the participants one by one to ask you the questions. Thank you so much. Sure, sure, sure. sure, 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 sure. Mr. Arjun uh, Lakhe, please go ahead with your question. Please. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Awesome. Sir, yeah, I, yeah, I, I can yeah. Yes, yes. I just want to ask one question. Uh, you talked about that in house editing. Uh, yes. But uh, in case of uh, back tracking, suppose mm -hmm. I have 1000 uh, respondents data and that I have entered mm -hmm. into the Excel, MS Excel, okay. then I, I will go to how I will go back to the respondents for the uh, unsatisfactory. While, while entering the data, when you are convert, when you are transferring the data from your questionnaire to the Excel, you will okay. have come across some of these question questionnaires which are uh, not put not been uh, filled correctly. That is where you do backtracking. Otherwise, you cannot do backtracking once the once you put in uh, put it in Excel. Then it becomes very difficult to uh, go back to the uh, identify that questionnaire and questionnaire number and then go back to the customer and ask and, or go back to the respondent and ask. You will have to backtrack only uh, when you uh, transfer that data from your questionnaire to the Excel sheet. Okay. And uh, always, uh, it is always, uh, uh, you know, advisable to have at least some kind of a contact uh, number or, um, you know, uh, some contact detail of the respondent so that it becomes easy to backtrack. Yes, actually what happens generally we take help of the field investigators to collect correct, the data. Correct, correct. Isn't correct, it? Correct, correct, and uh, correct, we, correct. We, can't, we come to know after getting the rough only after, yes, only after getting yes. the yes. So it, it, it becomes very difficult to go back to the respondents and the contact and get it corrected. I understand. Yes, that's the problem, problem, sir. Yeah. That, yes, that happens, you, uh, and then you can always plug in some values, some neutral values in those cases. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Devika, please go ahead with your question. Dr. Devika, please go ahead with your question. Uh, Dr. Devika, please go ahead with your question. Last call for you. Um, okay, I'll come back to you. Mr. Sushant Lehri, please go ahead with your question. Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes, okay. I can hear you. Yes. Uh, sir, I want to, I have a question regarding test to be test. Uh -huh. uh, which, yes, sir. Sir, does that mean that we will have to survey the same sample with a different set of questions? No, 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 no. Test, test reset, uh, retest does not mean that. Basically, test reset, retest means um, you know you are you are you are also doing uh, something called as um, um, pre-testing the questionnaire, no? On a small uh, sample. Yeah, you are doing a small sample, no? Okay. Once you do that small sample, you will get to know where where are the pitfalls. 
Okay. And and then that becomes test retest. No, once you have tested that, and then you again uh, retest the test on a larger sample. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That's how you will come to the uh, reliability because test re otherwise test re retest happens uh, for let's say medical uh, research. Then the test re test is basically they are doing, they are giving those injections and testing again retesting. So that that's where yes. reliability. But sir, this survey thing will become very difficult because people. Uh, will survey you be... survey you are doing a sample survey. No? You you are doing a you want uh, you are doing a pilot uh, study. Pilot. Okay. Yeah. That's where uh, this reliability can be checked. Okay. So, sir, once I do a sam uh, survey on a pilot uh, yes. case a sample, and then can I change yes. questions according to oh, like? Yes, of course. That's that's that the is reason a, why you are supposed to do a pilot uh, study. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir. Um, participants, just to let you know. The presentation for this session has been posted on the Telegram group for self-study. Also, the feedback link is available on the Telegram group and the chat box. Kindly fill it up before 7 p.m. today. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shamia, please go ahead with your question. Ms. Shamia, please go ahead with your question. Uh, we'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are audible. You are audible. Yes. Oh, uh, sir, you spoke about data coding. Is data yeah. coding similar to uh, val adding value labels in SPSS software? Ah, yes. In SPSS software, yes. They, they call it adding value labels. They they say you put uh, you put one when there is a yes, and you put no uh, zero when there is a no. That's it. That's exactly what is data coding. Okay, okay. And so you spoke about those symbols X1, X2. I, I don't understand that. Could you okay. So X1, X2 is nothing but uh, you know in the Excel sheet you have A1, A2. Uh, you have uh, you have those uh, um, column names. No? Okay. In Excel you have those column names. No, A, A B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You can call them as uh, you you can call them as variable names. So you, you can use that as x1, x2, x3. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh. Uh, thank you, Miss uh, Pooja Agarwal. Please go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, in data editing part, you had mentioned about plugin value. Yeah. So, so can you give an example that how can a plugging a neutral value can be done? Okay, uh, you see um, what happens sometimes you ask people to uh, rank. Okay, uh, you rank them uh, from one to ten or something like that. Okay, a, a single variable is given and say you you give them give them a, give this variable a rank. Uh, customer service. Okay, let's say. Um, the um, the ambience in the in a in a hotel. How did you find it? And you put it from one to ten. You give some rank. You are you ask you you are asking them to give a rank. And one or two respondents miss that rank. They miss giving you the rank there. They they don't even they don't write neither they write ten nor they write one in that. So what do you do with that? Yeah. Are you are you getting my point? Uh, are you? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. So what what do you do with the with that thing when when they give a blank? Then you what you do is you take an average and say five. Yes, sir. So that you don't spoil the data. Okay, sir. On your from your mind you can't put some number, so you put a neutral number. Okay, sir. You know, otherwise what would happen if you were, if you are uh, if you are uh, going to a dis uh, do some descriptive analysis and uh, give a graph out of that? There would be a gap there, or the graph falls. You know, everybody is giving six, seven, eight, nine. Suddenly it goes to zero, and then again comes back to uh, six, seven, eight, nine. Why the sudden drop? Because nobody has, he has not answered there, so it is considered as zero. So instead of that, you give a uh, neutral number there. Yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't make uh, for all calculations. It doesn't make any difference. That's why plug in a neutral. 
Okay, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Harpreet Kaur, please go ahead with your question. Ms. Harpreet Kaur, please go ahead with your question. Uh, we'll come back to you. I think, uh, no, uh, she's unmuted, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sir, I, I have a doubt regarding the type of the data, like uh, interval and the ratio. I am not getting the clarity be between these two. Uh, it looks like overlapping. Uh, what is the difference between exact difference between the interval and the ratio? Okay, if I ask a question, and uh, if I ask a question like uh, what your age group. And when I put a, when I ask a question age group and uh, uh, and say that I, do you belong to the age group of uh, 15 to 25, 25 to 35, 35 to 45, 45 to 50, you know, 55, etc. Then I am asking an interval question, and I, what I am collecting is an interval date. Okay. And if I ask a straight question, I what's your age? And you you give let's say an age of 24 or 25 or, or 35 or something. You are giving a number. That's a ratio scale. Okay, so it depends upon the question you are asking whether correct. we are correct. Okay. Correct. Now once so you, you, you if you collect data in ratio scale, you can convert it into interval interval scale. Okay. So it, I, I, earlier I thought uh, that uh, a num if it is a number, is just like as, as you have mentioned in your slide that uh, the number of uh, children. So it could be in the interval as well as in the. Uh, you can ask it in a, in an interval scale as well as in a, a, a as well as it can be a ratio scale. Okay, sir. Okay. And sir, there is an, another question I have. Uh, for example, yeah. I have downloaded uh, data from uh, uh, regarding Nifty from NSC website, and uh, for the purpose of okay. uh, my analysis, uh, I have to delete some of the uh, some of the data of partic particular dates. For example, of weekends. So yes. uh, it is also known as a called as a uh, data editing or cleaning. What what yes. I called it? Yes, data cleaning. Data cleaning. Yes. Data cleaning. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That, that also has to be done. Uh, you have to remove all the unnecessary data. Uh, I call it as a data cleaning. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, this Munira Kamawala, please go ahead with your question. Uh, Miss Munira Kamawala, please go ahead with your question. She is not. She is not unmuted. Uh, Munira Kamawala, uh, Kamawala is not unmuted. She is unmuted. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, sir. Uh, yeah. Sir, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a set of two, three questions. I'll ask one by one. Is it fine, sir? Okay. Yeah. yeah so, the, so for, uh, first thing is when we collect data, we can collect through a survey, right? In the yeah. form of a questionnaire. Yeah. So there, yeah. in order to maintain anonymity and confidentiality, we will not be taking their names and the contact details. Okay. Correct. So in yeah. that case, data editing uh, uh, might be difficult. That will be a big, big problem. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so that means only when you do it through interview or field investigation, then only backtracking will be uh, comparatively easier. Yes. Correct. Okay. Otherwise, then it becomes non-response error. We'll have to simply trash that. Uh, okay. Okay. Fine. Sir, and secondly, could you just elaborate? I'm sure you have given an ample example, but I'm still unable to understand. Not a problem. Uh, correcting wrong entries and allocating missing values. These two things, if you could just explain me in... Uh, a different way or something like that, sir. Uh, when you when you collect when you collect data, sometimes yes. uh, you know um, uh, there are a lot of wrong entries that happen. You know, basically, when questionnaire filling, when you ask people to fill up a physical questionnaire, okay, uh, then there are going to be some wrong entries. Okay, uh, you ask people their name, they write the address there. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So a lot of such, you know, when you ask something, they write something else. 
Okay. Uh, probably uh, since they, there is no uh, there is no line there to arrive. Or sometimes you have asked an address. Uh, you are supposed to give two lines. You can only one line, so it overlaps and things like that. So all this needs to be corrected. This, this has this data has to be corrected in the sense um, uh, that has to be, you have to correct that data. Wrong, uh, these wrong entries have to be corrected. Okay. Yeah. You ask for a, a mobile number, they give a landline number. You were planning to send an SMS, but since it's a landline number, SMS will not go, so you will have to correct that data. But how do we correct so, it? That is what's correct it in the sense you either get the, get the mobile number or you delete it. So okay. that, that's what this correction of uh, wrong entries. Okay, okay. Because you cannot use it. You can, sometimes you don't, you are not able to use that data. Okay. So that has to be correct. Okay. The other thing was? Missing values. Missing values, yes. Uh, missing values, you either plug them in, uh, you know, the ranking scale and all, if they, if they don't answer, then you put a neutral there. If you want to use that questionnaire. If you don't want to use that respondent, then you can completely remove that respondent. But if you still want to use the respondent, then you will have, then you can, you will have to put a uh, neutral value there because you may be you may have asked 50 questions out of that one question he he or she has not that respondent has not answered you would not like to leave that data okay so what you do is for that data for that question you put a neutral value like you have asked them to rank the rank one one is to ten they not answered so you put a five there instead of putting a zero because putting a zero would, would not uh, really make uh, you, you, a person may not have disagreed completely. Okay. You don't know. You cannot be judgmental. Uh, okay. Middle. So SPSS takes care of this, sir? SPSS does not take care of this. No, it doesn't. We have to do it manually. Yes. You okay. Have, you have to give full data to SPSS. Sir. We do not take care of this. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Participants, uh, we request you all to ask one question uh, at a time. The rest can always be put up on the chat box. Our end of your is uh, maximum participants will get a chance to ask questions within a given timeline. Maximum participants can benefit uh, if one question is asked. Uh, it's a kind request. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Reema Shah, can you please go ahead with your question? Yeah, please unmute, uh, Ms. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, sir. I uh, have a doubt with respect to the measurement scale for age category, sir. especially when we put it uh, the data in the SPSS. So uh -huh. I am uh, kind of confused. Is it an ordinal scale or, or is it an interval scale, sir? Age well, category. Depends upon if you are asking cat. If you say age category, then it becomes interval scale. Age but if category. It, yeah, but if you just say age, then it becomes a ratio scale. Okay, it, so it is not, never an ordinal scale, sir. We cannot give so order. It can be ordinal scale. Okay. It's not an order at all. No? Ordinal scale means if you have asked a person uh, whether you are the eldest or the youngest or the middle uh, middle uh, uh, child, then it okay. becomes ordinal scale. Okay, but if I'm taking it in number, then it is an interval scale. That yeah. is category. Each category means it's an interval scale. Okay, so sir, based on this, if I ask for qualification up to SSC, HSC, graduation, post-graduation, is that ah. an ordinal scale, sir? No. So uh, up to HSC. Up to up if you are asking up to HSC, HSC yes. to graduation, graduation yes. to graduation, two post graduation. If you are yes. usually you know this is a nominal scale. Okay, okay. This is nominal because uh, there is no order to it, and there is no not necessary that uh, people uh, assign orders to it. Now there are so many respondents in there are so many participants in this. Uh, uh, webinar only. Uh, most yeah. of them are PhDs also, okay. and some of them would be, you know, postgraduates. They would have done two to postgraduate degrees. Right. They would have done MA and MSc or MA LLB or something like that. Now you can't right. say that if, if you have done MCom and MA, you cannot mm -hmm. say MCom is lower, MA, MA is higher, or MA is right. lower, or MCom is higher. So it can't be ordered. Right. It, it it is nominal. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, 
participants, this would be the last question, one more question. Uh, we would request others to please post their questions yes. on the chat. So we pass on to the start. Mr. Debanjan Basak, please go ahead with your question. Uh, Madam, uh, before I answer Mr. Debanjan Basak's uh, question, uh, I would like to answer this question. Mr. Arjun Lakhe has asked one question privately. Mm -hmm. Sure, sir. Uh, because uh, it's a very pertinent thing that he has asked. He has asked, what is the connection? Why have you uh, included scale of measurement and uh, selecting test, selecting statistical test? <coughs> His question is, what is connection of scale of measurement and selecting test, selecting statistical tests? This is the question that Mr. Arjun Lakhe has asked. So, uh, for the benefit of all, I would like to answer this question. Uh, my contention has always been that if we know how we are going to test, then it will be easy for selecting the uh, scale of measurement. Or if we, if we if we know if we have collected the scale of the scale of measurement, if we have decided this should be the scale of measurement, then we should know what we are going to how we are going to test this. If we are going to ask the age of the participant, we should know that we are going to use this age as a ratio scale and use a correct statistical test. If we are going to ask age range, then this is an interval scale and we should know what we are going to, how we are going to use it in the uh, statistical uh, test that we are going to conduct. Yeah. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. You. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Debanjan, please go ahead with your question. Yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Debanjan, uh, you are unmuted. Please go ahead Good with your question. Good afternoon, sir. Presentation. Good afternoon, Mr. Dibanjanji. Tell me. Hello. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Sir, uh, a nice friend. And uh, my specific question on the reliability. And so, uh, sir, uh, checking the data of a course. And there is a uh, packet. This, uh, there is any software uh, like uh, with this we can check the reliability and validity of the uh, Dr. Gar, could you hear his question? I think uh, partly I could hear something. Uh, uh, I would like to rephrase. He is, I think, asking whether there is some software to check reliability and validity of uh, the data collected. Even I could the same, yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, um, Mr. Dibanjan, uh, we are talking of reliability and reliability of uh, not only the data, but we are also talking about reliability of the measurement instrument that we are using, like questionnaire. So, um, there is, uh, as far as my knowledge is, I think you, you need to. Uh, do the testing, retesting, etc., and try to find out whether the data that you have collected is reliable or not. Uh, a software will not be able to give you. Uh, maybe a software would be able to tell you that this is a this is a valid uh, data or uh, invalid data. For example, uh, validity for that matter. Uh, <clears throat> if when you use SPSS, no. Uh, if you have asked uh, 400 people, if you have asked them what is their gender and uh, 398 people have either said male or female and two people have not said anything. <clears throat> then SPSS tells you what is the valid percent. There you know it says valid percent, two people have not answered, so this is not valid. But uh, many times <clears throat> that is validity only for that data. But we are talking of validity of the instrument and, and reliability of the instrument. And for that, uh, human uh, human being is the only correct software there. No, human being is the right machine there. Have I answered your question, Mr. Divanjan? Uh, sir, uh, I think he is lost network connection. Oh but my. I think majority of uh, the uh, part of the answer, otherwise we will take his question separately on the chat box then. Okay. Uh, what should we do with the uh, questions on the chat box? Uh, so we will uh, send it to you and okay. uh, then uh, send the answers back to them. Is that okay with you? Not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. 
so uh, to end the session thank you so much dr garg for the session on variables and data grouping i'm sure this was very informative to all of us given the fact that we have so many people who have uh, questions related to the same yeah so, just to reiterate the presentation for self study and the feedback link is already on the telegram group kindly fill up the form today before 7 pm we meet again for dr garth's second session at 4 pm meeting link will be posted one hour prior to the session kindly log in 20 minutes before thank you and signing off team research methodology international workshop thank you thank you